Good morning, everyone. My name is Brett Felton, and I'm the National Industrial Market Manager for Graybar. I'd like to welcome you to today's G2 Talk webinar on machine safety applications and standards. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our industrial customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee, courtesy of Graybar, as a thank you for your time today. So thank you. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We will address as many questions as time permits, but we will do so at the end of the presentation. Uh, so please make note of that. And if we are unable to address your question in the time we have available today, we will have a Graybar representative follow up with you directly. Lastly, our G2 talks are all archived on the graybar.com website. So you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. We're happy to team up today with Loitza. As an electrical distributor, Graybar works alongside Loitza to provide customer support in areas like machine safety, and we can provide any needed safety PPE, safety tools, or additional electrical items needed. At this time, I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Curtis Halstead. Curtis has over 10 years of experience in machine safety and safety standards. He was a controls engineer in the automotive and capital equipment industry before leading the safety services department at Loitza. So without further ado, I would like to turn the presentation over to Curtis. Take it away, Curtis. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Today we're going to discuss some AOPD applications as well as some of the more common standards that we need to adhere to when we talk about AOPD safety. Uh, when the webinar is finished, uh, or later on any time, if you have any applications that come up or any safety questions, um, you can either talk to your Graybar representative or you can contact us here directly at Loitza. Uh, Alex Farrell is our product manager, uh, and then I am the, also the control systems engineer. So if you have any questions uh, after this or in the future, uh, give us a call and we'll be sure to help you out with those. So today, we're going to be mostly talking about some general standards, uh, especially safe distance calculations. We'll talk about some AOPD functions, the basic and advanced, uh, applicate, typical applications where we see these AOPDs, and then we'll also talk a little bit about uh, the Lloyds and Machine Safety Services. So the relevant guidelines that we typically use uh, when we do our safety services inspections and when we also give recommendations uh, are OSHA 1910, this is the Bible, I guess, for most safety people. Uh, the only problem with OSHA 1910 is it's a little vague. Uh, but if you look in the beginning of OSHA 1910, it will tell you some of the other standards that it's referencing. And some of those are uh, the Ontario regulations in Canada, uh, the ANSI standards, ANSI B11 in particular, uh, Robotic, Industries of Associ uh, Robotic Industries Association 1506, which is the robot safety standard, which has a lot of information about AOPDs, and then the CSA Z434, which also has a lot of information about AOPDs. So when we're talking about safety on a machine, the first thing we have to do is how to find what the right protection system is for the application. The easiest way to do this is with a risk assessment. So this is going to help us find the necessary safety level and figure out which hardware components are best suited for the application. So a couple of things we need to think about when we do a risk assessment is what are the dangerous movements of the machine? Is it a, a press brake or is it a robot cell or, or something like that? We need to find out what is the dangerous motion. We need to figure out what's gonna, what could happen during the normal work so normal operations, loading, unloading, cycling. But we, we also need to think about what can happen during setup. Um, and when we talk about that, 
we usually overlook what can happen during the maintenance setup. So when we do a maintenance setup, uh, we usually have like a bypass switch where we can disable some of the safety stuff. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about designing a safety control system. So what measures and components are necessary to improve the safety on the machine? Is it going to be fences and sheet metals for general reduction, you know, keep somebody out? Are we going to look for more of a detection-based solution, which would be an AOPD, uh, which is an active optoelectronic protective device, uh, typically a light curtain, multi-beam, or a safety scanner. So when we say AOPD, that's what we're talking about. Um, and then the stuff that goes along with that, we're going to need a safety relay or a safety controller, um, actuators, contactors for the valves and drives. You know, there's a lot that goes into the safety-related portion of the control system. So when we look at that, we need to look at some of the risk elements to determine what is the safety level that we're going to need. So we basically look at three factors being what is the severity of the injury, how often are we exposed to that, and then how likely are we to avoid that injury? And when we take those three factors, we have a chart that is typically used um, in Europe and the United States, which is our, our performance level. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with safety category, which is one through four. Um, <clears throat> but more and more people are moving towards performance level, and that's what we here at Lloyd's use. So we look at our severity our frequency, and our possibility of avoidance, and we can follow that flow chart and get an idea of what the safety performance level is required on this machine. So we can do all of those things, um, and anybody can do a risk assessment uh, as long as they follow the correct guidelines. Or the other option is you can hire someone to do it for you, and that's something that we can do at LOITSA with our Machine Safety Services Department. So we can give you engineering and application advice. We can do the risk assessment for you. Uh, we can do a whole facility assessment, stop time measurements. Um, we have our startup hotline. We have our support hotline is uh, 24 hours. Um, we can do a safety inspection before operation of the machine. We can even go and look at a machine that is still being built um, to ensure that it arrives at your facility uh, already up to the safety standards. Because in the United States, once you take ownership of that machine, most of the responsibility is now on your shoulders. <clears throat> so the first thing we'll talk about is mechanical guarding. And we'll just spend a couple of seconds on this because it's pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes there's applications where we can't use an AOPD or where it just doesn't make sense. Um, if we're going to need to lock a door, obviously we can't do that with a, a light curtain. So that's where we look at an a interlocking switch. Um, so we have switches that will interlock and lock the door, or we have switches that will just tell us that the door is open. And that's really going to depend on the application. But if you're hard guarding your machine, typically there's going to be some type of an interlock associated with that guard, whether it's a door or just checking for um, presence of that guard. So if we have our hard guarding installed, or even if we have a light curtain installed, we still need to look at what we call the auto method. So it's a very simple way to, to see if how what you have mounted is correct or what is necessary to be supplemented to the guarding that you have. So the barrier or any barrier openings needs to be sized that a person cannot reach around, under, through, or over and access that hazard. So if you can reach around, under, through, or over, a light curtain, a guard of anything, and reach that dangerous point in the machine, then we need to do some changes to that guarding because we're not up to standards. And I know a lot of people will think, well, nobody should put their hand through here, so we really don't need to guard that. But you have to remember that most of these safety standards were not written on theory. They were written on practice. So most of the time you see a standard, even if it's weird, it's because somebody probably did that at one point. Um, this is what we typically use for our hard guarding reach through um, checks. It's a gotcha stick. I'm sure a lot of people have seen these before. It's just a, usually a metal or a plastic stick with graduated marks on it. Um, the stick gets wider as you get closer to the end. So if you can reach through any of those openings with this stick and touch the hazardous portion, then we're mounted too close. Um, and it goes up to 
two and a quarter inches, which is about a 31 inch safe distance you have to be. And anything bigger than that, um, you have to move basically back to 48 inches. So a six inch maximum hole opening, because that's what they're saying a person can reach their arm all the way through. So when we talk about some of our barrier guards um, and AOPDs as well, which we'll get into in a second, but for a hard guarding, there's a couple different standards you can look at. The OSHA standard says we have to have our hard guard, and when I say hard guarding, we're here we're talking about perimeter guard, uh, like fencing. So OSHA says that our hard guarding has to be mounted no more than one foot off of the ground, and then the top of that guard must be at least 48 inches. And that's what ANSI and RIA say as well. Um, in Canada and Europe, the distances are six inches off the ground and 72 inches for the top of the gate. What we typically see in the United States is more and more people are going towards that end of the spectrum versus the OSHA version. Um, and that's kind of a good thing because the, they, they keep saying that these uh, standards are going to be harmonized and that we're all going to be adhered to the same um, the same strictness that Europe and Canada is. So what we typically see is the six foot high guard with uh, six or 12 inches off the ground. This is also going to be a product of how far we can reach over. So OSHA again is at six inches minimum, so if you can reach over the guard, the hazard has to be at least six inches from that point. Uh, most people do much more than six inches. Most people stick with the CSA number, which is around two feet almost. So now we'll look at some typical AOPD applications. So again, AOPD, active optoelectronic protective device, typically light curtain, multi-beam safety scanner. So there's usually three typical applications we see um, for AOPDs. Access guarding, perimeter guarding, this is where we would use a multi-beam. Um, this is going to be far enough away from the hazard where we don't have to worry about depth of penetration issues, and we'll talk about depth of penetration here in a moment. Um, but so basically here we're going to be looking for a trip device. We want to make sure nobody walks into this area. We can do it cheaper with a multi-beam than we can with a light curtain because it's less optics. Um, we can also go farther distances than we can with a light curtain. So it's a really nice product to use for a perimeter guard application because we can make a big perimeter around the entire dangerous area with one device, bounce it off a couple mirrors, and we're finished. Um, the problem is we have to be a little further back. The areas where we would typically see a light curtain used would be danger point guarding or danger area guarding. And what we're going to do here for danger point guarding this is going to be up close and personal with the machine, um, manually fed, or we're going to have a light curtain that's going to be very close to the danger point. So we're going to have a light curtain with smaller resolution than we would see on an MLD, uh, I'm sorry, a multi-beam. So we're going to have a smaller resolution, which means we can insert our hand not as far before we trip and it lets us get a lot closer to the machine. This is where you're going to see it on um, process machines where they're hand loading, hand unloading. Um, you also see it a lot on like press brakes um, and die brake, um, sorry, <coughs> trim presses as well. The other place where we'll see a light curtain is a danger area guarding. A lot of times you'll see a light curtain in this application being used in a horizontal method instead of vertical. Um, and basically we're using it kind of as a trip here, but our depth of penetration in a horizontal fashion is going to be a very large. But, so it's mostly looking for a presence detection. We want to make sure nobody is in that area when the machine starts up. Then with our safety laser scanners, the things we'll typically see is an access guard. As you can see in the left-hand picture, we can set up a, two different fields with that scanner. And what we're doing in that picture is the forklift driver is going in and pulling a pallet out of one side, and the scanner is allowing him to do that. But if somebody were to walk into the other side of the cell, it would turn off. And then similar to what we did with the light curtain when we had it placed horizontally, 
we can do that with one light. Um, <clears throat> we can do that with one safety scanner. Put it in the corner of the cell. We can draw out the area that we want to um, detect, and we can check to see if anybody is in that area before the machine starts. That's a very common application you'll see in robot cells, where we have a door and we want to make sure nobody opened the door, walked in, and shut the door behind them. The laser scanner will tell us if somebody is inside that area. So one of the important things we talk about with AOPDs is the safe distance. Um, many people, when they buy a light curtain, they assume they just put the light curtain on the machine. The machine is now safe. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. We have to make sure that we have our safety distance correct for it to actually be safeguarding our employees. So you know, there's a few different safety distance formulas we can use. Um, we'll, we'll focus on the, the OSHA version first, or actually we'll, we'll just stick with the OSHA version. There is uh, an RIA number and there's also a EN999 number that actually are a bit more complicated than the OSHA one. So we'll stick with the OSHA, which is a little more simplified. So OSHA tells us that safety light curtains must be mounted at a sufficient distance from the pinch point or point of operation hazard to ensure that the machine stops before a person's hands, arms, or body reaches the hazard. So the machine is going to take a certain amount of time to stop. We need to make sure that after I pass through that light curtain, before I actually reach that hazard, the machine has indeed stopped. So we need to figure out what is the stopping time of the machine, which will help us find the safe distance for the mounting. One thing to note, if you see there in the second paragraph, is that regardless of the calculated distance, a light curtain should never be mounted closer than six inches from the point of operation. This is something that we see in the field a lot, where people have them mounted very, very close to the point of operation. We need to remember, the standard says six inches minimum regardless of the stopping time of the machine. So the OSHA calculation is D sub S, which is our minimum safe distance, is equal to 63 times T sub S, and T sub S is the stopping time of the machine. So there's a couple ways you can do that. You can take the stopping time of the machine and then add that to the response time of the light curtain and add that to the response time of the relay, or you can just do a safe, a safe distance calculation with a safe distance stopping machine, which will give you all of this in one nice number. Um, and that's a, a feature there, um, I'm sorry, a service that Loitza can do for you as well. So OSHA says that 63 inches per second is the speed of a hand. <clears throat> so to simplify that, if your machine takes one second to stop, then 63 inches away is where the light curtain needs to be mounted. So it's very important that we know what that stopping time of the machine is because it's going to dictate how close or how far we have to be from the machine. So the second part of that equation is depth of penetration, which is not on there, but we need to remember that as well. So depth of penetration is going to be added on to our safe distance calculation. So if the machine takes, again, one second to stop, that puts us 63 inches away from the machine, but we also need to now know what our depth of penetration is. And what that is is how far, on a worst-case scenario, can I stick my hand into that light curtain before it will trip? So even on the smallest resolution light curtain, which is typically 14 millimeters, that's the, the standard for uh, fingertip detection, you can stick your fingertip in there a certain amount of distance before it will be detected. And I think on a 14 millimeter light curtain, that's typically one half of an inch. So if our safe distance calculation said it was 63 inches, we would have to add one half of an inch for a 14 millimeter light curtain. Uh, for a 30 millimeter light curtain, it's closer to three inches. And then when we talk about a multi-beam, our depth of penetration is much, much larger which is why it works really well for a perimeter guard because we can't get really close with a multi-beam. So if you see here, if our light curtains, I'm sorry, our multi-beams are mounted correctly within standards, which would be no more than 12 inches off the ground, and if our top optic 
on the multi-beam is greater than 48 inches, then our depth of penetration becomes 36 inches. And that's based on beam spacing. So it says here 64 millimeters is the beam spacing we're looking at, which is very, very typical on a, um, on a multi-beam. Usually it's 100 or 200 millimeters. So 36 inches is the distance that I can reach my arm into that field before I trip one of the beams. Now, if we have it mounted lower than 48 inches, then our depth of penetration goes up to 48 inches because now I can not only reach my arm in there, but I can also lean over uh, a little bit. So we have to add that onto there as well. So with that same application we were talking about, 63 inches per second, one second to stop the machine, if we use a multi-beam instead of a light curtain, now our safe distance is 36 inches farther back. So now we're talking about 99 inches um, mounting distance. So again, multi-beams have their place. They're great for perimeter guards, but they're going to keep you far from the machine. So we need to remember that when we're talking about picking the hardware for a certain application. If we want to do it correctly, we may need to use a light curtain where we would instead use a, a multi-beam. The pricing is better on a multi-beam. They're more flexible. They're really easy to set up, and they work great. But remember, we got to stay far away with those. <clears throat> So when we talk about using a device horizontally, now there's some more application or uh, some more formulas that we need to talk about, and I'll just skip over this real quick. It, it's not a super common application, but we need to look at our height, meaning how high our horizontal field is mounted off the ground. What is our resolution? So our resolution typically needs to be smaller than a person's leg, which is usually around 60 millimeters. Um, and then we also need to make sure that our depth of penetration is calculated, which is going to be much, much higher, because we can now not only reach our hands through, but we can step a certain distance before we actually get into that field. And that's going to be similar to what we see on our safety scanner. So regardless of the resolution of the safety scanner, our depth of penetration is going to be 4 feet. And that's because that's how far a person can step before they reach that field. Because in most applications, the safety scanner is going to be mounted about a foot off the ground. So you can step pretty far into that field before it will actually see you. Um, we can lower that a little bit if we have a, let's say if it's elevated and we have to step up to get into the field. We can drop that down to about 36 inches in those cases, but we're never going to get lower than 36 inches. So in this case, we need to remember it's going to be similar to a perimeter guard with the multi-beam where we're not going to be able to get real close to the machine before we turn it off because our depth of penetration is so large. And that's, you're going to see the same thing with a um, safety mat as well. It's going to be the exact same formula that you see here with the scanner. And now we'll talk about a couple of AOPD functions that we see on most light curtains. Um, and some of these are very important to the application and how we're using them to make sure that we're, we're meeting the safety standards. And one of the most important ones is the restart interlock. <clears throat> the restart interlock is prevent, prevents the automatic start after actuation of the safety function. So basically what that's saying is anytime that light curtain is interrupted, we're going to have a reset button where we have to reset the light curtain before it goes to active again. So if we're in an application where we're using a multi-beam, and this is almost universal for an application with a multi-beam, a person can pass through that field, and then once they make it to the other side of that field, we need to make sure that the light curtain doesn't turn back on because now there's somebody in the dangerous area. So the restart interlock on any application where you can pass through the sensing field completely, we need to make sure we have that reset interlock. Another feature that a lot of curtains have nowadays are external device monitoring. This is very important for your control system. A lot of people aren't using it when they should be. But basically, if you're doing anything that's category two or higher, you need to have external device monitoring being used. And you can do that with the light curtain, or, or you can also do that through the safety relay. But one of the two needs to be doing it. And what that's going to do is look at 
our downstream contactors, so if we have a motor starter, a contactor, any type of a relay that we're actuating with the light curtain, it's going to check through the contacts of that downstream contactor and make sure that any time the light curtain cycles, that downstream contactor is also cycling. If it doesn't see that that one is shifting, it will assume that it's welded shut. You'll get a fault, out, you know, a fault indication on the light curtain, let you know that there's something going on with the EDM circuit. But it's very important to have. Some of the extended functions of the AOPDs, and we'll talk about those in a moment, are multi-scan, um, which is not a real popular one, but for certain applications it's necessary. If we have an application where uh, weld slag or metal chips you know, something large is flying out of the cell, we want to make sure that it doesn't get tripped. Uh, so what we can do is we can turn on multi-scan, and that will tell the light curtain that we need to see something in that field for two scans or three scans or more. The benefit of that is it will help us get rid of nuisance trips. The downfall is that it takes our response time and either doubles it or triples it. We're still talking about 5, 10 milliseconds, but it, but it is something that needs to be taken into account when we do our safe distance calculation. So we'll talk about some of the advanced functions of the AOPDs here. So fixed blanking is one that we see very common. If you have something that's going to be in the field, uh, in the safety field of the light curtain, we want to make sure to blank that out if it's something that's not going to be moving. So when we teach a blanked field into the light curtain, it's going to need to always see that that's there. If that piece is removed, then the light curtain is going to fault out and tell you that you have a blanked section that is now open. The other thing we need to remember is that once we blank out those beams, the area to the left and to the right of whatever our object is that's inside that sensing field also need to be either hard guarded or that object needs to take up the entire area of the light curtain. Because we've now basically disabled those beams, although they are being monitored by the light curtain, it doesn't know that there's something on the left side of that box or something on the right side of that box. So if that area is open, we need to make sure and guard it because otherwise I can stick my hands through there and the light curtain won't be able to tell. Floating blanking is uh, just a little tweak on the fixed blanking. Uh, it will allow the, the object to move a little bit inside the field, one or two beams. So this is going to be for some more specialized application where, like on a press break, where the object kind of floats a little bit or it flexes as the machine cycles. We need to be able to let it move a little bit. We don't want to let it pass anywhere inside that field, but we can tell if it's moved a little bit. The other one would be reduced resolution, which is another <clears throat> feature that is very common on press breaks and dies. So as we add, put our material into the machine, we want to be able to have that material sticking out of the machine in that light curtain presence sensing field without tripping the light curtain. And what we're basically doing with reduced resolution uh, to kind of simplify it is we're basically telling it, I need to trip two beams at once uh, to turn it off. And it's a very nice feature to have if the application calls for it, but again, it's going to affect our safe distance calculation because if we're telling it that it has to trip two beams, uh, if we have a 14 millimeter resolution light curtain, we need to do our depth of penetration at 28 because we're now we're telling it we have to see two beams broken. Muting is more of a material handling type application. Uh, we do see it in some other areas, but material handling is, is far and away the most popular place we see this. Uh, that's going to be uh, shrink wrapping, palletizing, uh, robotic cartoners, things like that, where we have a conveyor with a pallet or a box of product that runs into a cell. And when it gets into that cell, uh, we do some operation to it, shrink wrap it, palletize it, whatever. But we want that box to be able to go in and out of that cell without tripping the light curtain out. But we still need to protect from people to go in. So what that's going to do is we'll have a couple of muting sensors that will detect the box and allow the box to go through. But if a person were to try and walk through, it would trip it and turn the light curtain off. So if you have one of these systems, 
there's a couple publications you can read in the ANSI of how to do this. Also, I believe RIA 1506 has um, some standards on how to mount these sensors. And then again, if you buy a system, especially from us, uh, in our manual we will also tell you that where these things need to be mounted. There's a very particular distance that these sensors need to be from the light curtain and, um, and how high they're mounted as well so that we can ensure that it will pick up a person and not a box. So again, kind of a specialized application and there's some specialized regulations that go along with it. Um, if you find yourself in a situation where you are going to be using one of these, uh, you can talk to your gray bar rep or you can talk to us here at Lloyd's and we'll be happy to give you advice on, on how to set those up correctly. <coughs> And the last thing we'll talk about is the rotoscans. So this is kind of a, the nice thing about rotoscans is that they only have one device. You don't have a, a multi-beam or a light curtain setup where you have a transmitter or receiver. We're going to be doing this with a diffuse method of detection. So we're going to shoot light out and look for the light that bounces back to tell us if there's something there. <clears throat> the most common application and, and kind of what these laser scanners were designed for originally was the AGV. So if you see the top picture, automated guided vehicle, um, you're looking out in front as that is driving along by itself, make sure no one steps in front of it. If someone steps in front of it, the, <clears throat> the roto scan will tell it that there is an obstruction and it will stop. Um, on the bottom one here, we can do presence sensing. So we're not using it so much as a trip device here, we just want to make sure that nobody's inside that cell when it starts up. And here's a picture of a, a typical application where we would see a roto scan. This is like a gantry crane type application that moves back and forth on these rails. Uh, it's going to be doing all of this automatic without human interaction. So we need to make sure that it's looking to make sure nobody is in the way and also to look if there's anything for it to run into. If somebody leaves a pallet, uh, laying on the tracks is going to see that and tell it to stop. So some of the advantages of laser scanners that we don't have on the, on the multi-beams and the light curtains is that it is one device. We don't have a transmitter and receiver, so our mounting is very, very flexible. Um, we can safeguard all kinds of areas with these devices as well because our software allows us to look at only what we want to look at. So we, we mount the scanner, it will tell us everything it sees, and we can tell it, well, we only want to look in this area. And anything that walks into this area is a danger. Uh, we have multiple field pairs, so if you have an application where um, your setups change, or especially if you're on an AGV, we need to be able to switch our detection zones. So if our AGV is running at full speed, we want to have uh, detection zone that looks a little further out, which gives it more time to stop. Whereas if we're moving slowly or we're going to a docking station, we can bring that detection zone much closer because we're going to be moving a lot slower. Uh, they're very easy to use, very flexible. Uh, the drawbar or the drawback again is our depth of penetration, so we can't be up close and personal with the machine um, unless we put it in a vertical orientation, and then we can get closer, but not as close as you can with a light curtain. And that's all we have for today. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them now. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, at this time, we'd like to address some questions that have been submitted. And as a reminder to the audience, uh, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you would like to submit a question uh, this time, uh, go ahead and click there and shoot it over to us. Uh, also, if we don't get to your question in the time allowed, uh, again, we will follow up with you directly after the presentation. All right, uh, Curtis, a uh, couple of questions have come in. Uh, in fact, a few people uh, have um, commented that now that they've seen this presentation, uh, they, they would like a machine assessment themselves. Uh, so who can they contact so that uh, we can get a team in there to help them? Well, the first thing to do is just to contact your local gray bar representative, um, and they'll get the information that we need, and then they'll contact us, and we can set up sending somebody out. Um, when we do these, again, we don't charge um, for anything other than time. So 
As long as it takes us to do it, that's all you'll get charged. We don't mark anything up, just an hourly rate. Yeah, thank you very much, Curtis. Uh, as we noted at the beginning of this G2 talk, uh, Graybard teams up with Loitza for uh, these type of machine safety solutions and machine safety assessments. Uh, so yes, contact your local Graybar representative. Uh, and also we will send out a follow-up email to all attendees and it will have a uh, link uh, so that you can contact us and request a machine assessment if you'd like. All right, uh, Curtis, a couple more here. Um, would you be willing to do a one to two hour safety training for my team at my facility on this topic? Uh, certainly. Um, we, we've done this in the past. Uh, some of the larger uh, companies that we deal with, they have, they'll want, you know, the whole engineering team or the whole maintenance team to, to come and sit in and we'll do an expanded version of this. You know, obviously it's going to be much more detailed. Um, and we can do one, two, three, four hours. Um, and we can tailor that, you know, specifically to what your company does or we can do kind of a broad overview on safety standards. Um, you know, and we've done this before, like I said, and, you know, afterwards we'll usually take a walk through the plant, you know, with the engineers or the maintenance guys, kind of point out some of the stuff that we were talking about in the presentation. So, yeah, it's, it's something that we've certainly done before, and, and we're definitely open to doing some more. Okay. Uh, next one. Uh, what information is needed to uh, provide me a quote for a risk assessment? Um, the most important thing is, is really what type of machines that we're going to be looking at and then how many. Um, we've done these services before where we've looked at one machine. We've also done these services where we've looked at, you know, five buildings worth of machines. And it, it's really going to just depend on that. So how many machines, what type of machines, and any pictures or drawings that you may have that can help us figure out how big of a project we're looking at, and that's usually enough to get us going. All right, thanks. Uh, one of the more recent questions that just came in through the Q&A uh, box, can you explain how the different risk levels are interrelated with each other? Um, I guess the easiest way to do that is, so you have, like I said, in the United States we use two different kind of systems. We use performance level and category. More people are moving towards performance level, so that's kind of the one that I, I use in as, a, as an example. Um, and what you're basically looking at is performance level E means that that is what your control system must adhere to based on how severe the damage could be to a person. And, and basically anything other, anything past like losing a finger is considered, you know, basically performance level E. Performance level E is basically um, irreversible injury, so death, loss of finger, loss of an eye, something like that. <clears throat> and when you talk about the, the hardware that goes along with it, they're really, performance level C is basically the cutoff for, you know, a, a nice true safe system. Uh, that's kind of the, the correlation to safety category 2, if that's what you're more familiar with. Um, the difference between like safety category three and four is just implementation. Um, category two is a certain type of device that needs a certain type of monitoring. Very, very rarely does that get used in the United States. Almost everybody goes with category four equipment or performance level E equipment. And the only difference between say category three and four or performance level C and E is the implementation. It's still the same hardware. It's still the same fault monitoring. It's how are we wiring it? Are we doing our EDM back checks? And are we um, utilizing the start, restart, interlock, things like that if necessary? You know, it, it's still dual channel. It's still monitored inputs. It's basically the implementation. So it's same hardware, different Im implementation depending on the safety level. I don't know. I hope that <laughs> answered the question. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Curtis. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, we had a couple of uh, questions about the slides, and, and yes, a note to all of the members in the audience, uh, we will forward a copy of the slides to you all uh, after this G2 talk. All right. Uh, well, we are about out of time at this point. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your specific question, we will follow up with you after the presentation. 
Also, as a reminder, this presentation will be archived on the graybar.com website. Uh, so uh, you will receive an email soon uh, after this, and it will have a link to the website location uh, where we will archive uh, the G2 talk. So you can view, view it again as a recording, or again, please uh, feel free to recommend it to a colleague uh, so they can watch the webinar as well. Uh, also, that email will have a link, uh, as I said before, uh, so that you can contact us if you would like uh, a machine safety assessment done. All right. Uh, again, thank you to uh, thank you all for your time today. Thank you to Curtis Halstead with Loitza for the presentation, and uh, we hope all of you will join us next month uh, as we will have our next in the series of G2 Talk webinars for industrial customers. Uh, next month on June 24th, we'll have Schneider Electric on to talk about flexible motor management systems and best practices around motor controls to increase equipment uptime and efficiency. Thank you, everybody. That concludes today's G2 Talk webinar.